So thank you, everyone. I'm um, reluctant to say this since we are being filmed, but you know, I, I, I always joke that the commemoration of 1968, you know, should start with the commemoration of my birth. Um, so you know, another wonderful thing that happened in 1968. So, um, but. Uh, the Prague Spring became very, it's always been a, a subject that's fascinated me, um, and it became really near and dear to my heart this past summer. Uh, this past summer, I took 15, well, I was one of two faculty members who had 15 Villanovans in the city of Prague teaching a class on communism and post-communism. And because it was the anniversary, and because I was shamelessly plugging my 50th anniversary of being in this world, I had their final project be uh, asking them to use the city as an archive um, and commemorating the Prague Spring. The, um, the product of their efforts are beautifully displayed outside. There are three posters that have been submitted uh, by some of my students from the program, um, despite the fact that their grades were, were already submitted. But one of the things that they found was that this event was pivotal um, to the understanding of Prague and communism and re relations and, and life in the, uh, the capital of what is now the Czech Republic, which had, used, which had been um, Czechoslovakia. For those of you do, that don't know anything about this, I'm just going to chart very quickly a little backdrop, and then I'm going to leave it to our, our two experts to delve into the specifics of what we're talking about today. Uh, but the Prague Spring, um, today, if you, my students discovered this. When they went into the city, one of the groups for their final project followed a memoir that talked about their experience in the Prague Spring. And so they decided to follow the footsteps uh, of the participant. And when they did, they interviewed people along the way. And they would say, well, what, what do you know about the Prague Spring? And they all would say, the music concert, the festival. Because in Czech Republic now, 20 more than 20. So uh, a few decades past the fall of communism, it's, an, it's writing a new chapter. And the Prague Spring is part of this communist past. Uh, but in the January of 1968, uh, there was hope in Czechoslovakia that they were going to chart a new course. The new course that wound up being charted didn't come until 1989. But there was a moment in 1968 where they thought that anything could be possible. Uh, with the election to the head of the Communist Party of a man by the name of Alexander Dubček, who was a reformer. Um, sometimes in America, we have a hard time putting that together, that there could be a communist reformer within the Communist Party. But um, that happened not too infrequently uh, in the end stages of communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. Um, Alexander Dubček came into power, and he decided, even though Czechoslovakia was in what we call the Soviet bloc, it was part of the Soviets' buffer zone that they had created after World War II of friendly countries with which were they, they were aligned and which formed part of the Warsaw Pact, which was the answer to NATO, uh, a defensive alliance, which was the answer to NATO. Um, even though Czechoslovakia was a member of this, this uh, alliance, Dubček envisioned that Czechoslovakia might be able to chart their own course to a certain extent. And he envisioned creating what he called socialism with a human face that would allow for communism to remain, for the socialist system to remain, but for reduced centralization of power and for a liberalization of the press and an easing of censorship. And over the course of the spring, as the Communist Party started to enact these changes, the young people of uh, Czechoslovakia and Prague specifically embraced it. They loved it. It was intoxicating. Now, the communist leaders weren't foolish enough to think that they could do whatever they wanted. Uh, there had been a couple of occasions within the Soviet bloc uh, in 1953 and 1956, in Hungary most especially in 1956, where uh, communist governments tried to chart their own course. And in 1956, the Soviets came in with tanks. Dubček and the Czechoslovakians tried to do a delicate balancing act that tried trying to allay fears that they would leave the Warsaw Pact to avert any Soviet invasion. Uh, but as we'll find out today, their hopes were for naught. And in August of 1968, uh, August 21st, 1968, the Soviet tanks, along with tanks, and troops 
from the other member countries of the Warsaw Pact ran, rolled into Prague. And I think with that, that gives hopefully a little bit of a backdrop. Um, and then I will ask um, Dr. Brennan to pick up where I left off. Okay, thank you. And I think that's a really good transition given how my uh, presentation starts. Uh, the things I passed out, one is just a map uh, showing the invasion routes of Czechoslovakia by the Warsaw Pact forces. You can see who <laughs> occupied what. Uh, and then the other one is a cartoon by the underground uh, Czech uh, press depicting the five. The five other leaders of the Warsaw Pact who took part in the invasion. Uh, Leonid Brezhnev, Poland's Vladislav Gomulka, East Germany's Walter Ulbricht, Bulgaria's Tudor Shivkov, and Hungary's Janos Kadar. So that's who those guys are. Okay, so on August 1st, 1968, the Soviet ambassador of the German Democratic Republic, Pyotr Abrasimov, reported back to Moscow the attitudes of the East German leader, Walter Ulbricht, and the rest of the leadership of the Socialist Unity Party towards Czechoslovakian leader, Alexander Dubček, and especially, of course, his liberalizing reform agenda, the Prague Spring. Ulbricht noted Dubček and his cohorts were sly revisionists who have turned out not to be as simple people as they seemed initially. Abrasimov also noted the East German leadership expected all members of the Warsaw Pact to deal a collective blow using all available means against the reactionary and the counter-revolutionary forces in Czechoslovakia. And three weeks later, this is precisely what happened. As armies from five of the members of the Warsaw Pact, the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary, and a much more limited capacity, the GDR, invaded Czechoslovakia and crushed forever the attempt to create socialism with the human face. One of the ironies is, of course, the Warsaw Pact formed in 55 as a theoretically defensive alliance against the imperialist threat of NATO, launched its only major military offensive against one of its own members. The nature of Czechoslovak-Soviet relations and Czechoslovakia's communist regime was substantially different from other members of the Soviet sphere of influence. Of course, in 1939, the Czech regions had been absorbed by Nazi Germany. Slovakia had seceded to become a, an independent country and a German ally. Uh, the position of the Czechs during this initial period was initially ambiguous. The industrial resources of the country were a vital component of the German war machine. All the Czech resistance did accomplish one of the most visible successes of any underground in World War II, the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich. This secured its role as a member of the anti-Nazi alliance, and the Czech government in exile in London under the leadership of Edvard Benesch formed a very close alliance with the Soviet government, symbolized by a summit between Benesch and Stalin in Moscow in December of 43. Stalin promised full support for Benesch's plan of uniting Slovakia back in the Czech lands, getting the Sudetenland back, and then expelling the ethnic German population. Though not a communist, Benesch believed that Czechoslovakia could only survive as a state of strong Soviet support. The betrayal of the country by the British and the French in November in 38, and to a lesser extent the failure of the American Third Army to come to the aid of the Czech uprising in Prague in May of 45 convinced him the Western democracies were not consistent allies. And consequently, unlike in Hungary, Poland, or of course Germany, most Czechs and many Slovaks welcomed the Soviets as liberators, not as conquerors. And units of the Red Army tended to behave a little better there than elsewhere. The, Czech, the Communist Party in Czechoslovakia enjoyed far greater popular support than elsewhere in the Soviet sphere of influence, roughly comparable to the French and Italian Communist Parties. Although the coup, the Communist coup in Prague in February 48, was bitterly opposed by Benesch, who realized too late he had exchanged Soviet for German domination, it had a support between a quarter or a third of the country's population. Under the leadership first of Clement Gottwald from 48 to 53, and then Antonin Novotny from 53 to 67, the country was viewed by Moscow as one of its most reliable and stable satellites. In 1955, following the state treaty with Austria, which ended the Soviet occupation of that country and thereby the justification for keeping Soviet soldiers in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, the Warsaw Pact was formed. Uh, again, which uh, was one of the most important members. The Czechoslovakian People's Army, 200,000 men strong, was a vital component of Soviet strategic planning especially given the wariness in Moscow over the potential loyalty of the East German, Polish, and Hungarian soldiers. The Czechoslovakian army was effectively Sovietized in the early 50s in terms of uniforms, training, weapons, and political ideology. Of course, events in 56, as Lynn talked about, uh, would demonstrate how fragile this alliance was. Khrushchev's decision to denounce Stalin in February 56 contributed to a year of turmoil in two of the satellites, Hungary and Poland. 
And of course, in, Hung in Hungary, events went in the most radical direction. And in early November, the leader of the Prime Minister of Hungary, Emre Nagy, announced that Hungary was leaving the Warsaw Pact and would reestablish the pluralistic political system. This prompted Khrushchev's decision to have the Red Army re-enter the country and crush Nagy's government. Although Czechoslovakian soldiers didn't participate, Novotny gave his full support of the Soviet invasion as a necessary step to crush counter-revolution. Eleven years later, in December of 67, Novotny's ironclad hold of Czechoslovakia came to an end, as he was replaced by Alexander Dubček, a unique choice because he was a Slovak who had basically been on the outs for 20 years, uh, but also because of his innovative ideas for socialism with the human face, which involved limited free market reforms, greater legal control over the political police, uh, greater latitude for local and provincial authorities to deal with issues rather than just implementing Prague's directives, and loosening restrictions on freedom of speech, assembly, and religion, and greater autonomy for Slovakia. These reforms were known as the Prague Spring, introduced in March and April 68. They were entirely unprecedented. There had been some uh, similar economic reforms in Hungary and Yugoslavia, and Khrushchev also had released some censorship during the thaw from 56 to 64, but the Prague Spring went much further. Dubček was convinced that he could implement these reforms as the Communist Party was, had greater public support, and he was determined not to repeat the mistake of Neish, assuring Moscow Czechoslovakia would never leave the Warsaw Pact, nor would it reinstitute multi-party democracy. Unfortunately for Dubček, Leonid Brezhnev, who had overthrown Khrushchev in 64 and had quickly ended the thaw, he and the other leaders in the Politburo in Moscow viewed Dubček's policies of increasing disapproval, followed by scorn, followed by open hostility. Already by May of 68, Czechoslovakia's Warsaw Pact allies were becoming increasingly concerned. On May 8, 1968, the five, Brezhnev, Ulbricht, Kadar, Zhivkov, and Gomolka, met in Moscow to talk about the implications of the Prague Spring. Gomolka and Ulbricht uh, were the, immediately insisted that Czechoslovakia, if it couldn't regain its control of its country from the counter-revolution, and if a return to bourgeois order reared its head, military intervention would be a necessity. Brezhnev and Zhivkov agreed. The only one who was a little reluctant was Hungary's Kadar, urging greater caution, typically claiming Dubček needed more time to clean up the mess Novotny had left him. By August of 68, the patience of the five had run out. They demanded and received approval from Dubček for a meeting between his government and representatives from their governments in Bratislava on August 3rd, 68 where they demanded that Dubček rescind the reforms which had begun five months before. Gomolka was furious that Moscow even allowed this last-minute attempt uh, to allow Dubček to change course. Bluntly informing the Czech ambassador in Warsaw, Antonin Gregor, he doubted the Bratislava meeting would have any effect and harsher measures would be necessary. Of course, Gomolka turned out to be correct. Brezhnev's patience ran out three weeks later. On August 20th, the Warsaw Pact invasion force about 75% of it were soldiers from the Soviet army and contingents of Polish and Hungarian and Bulgarian soldiers with units of the East German Volksarmee in a supporting capacity. Everyone realized the symbolism of sending German soldiers in again, even if they were communist Germans. They entered Czechoslovakia to crush the Prague Spring. Interestingly, interest, indicating some reluctance on the Hungarian government, a high-ranking civilian or military official in Hungary informed the Czech ambassador in Budapest, Joseph Pilchuk, at 5 p.m. that day, the, uh, that an invasion was imminent. Uh, he, Putschek, reported this to Dubček at 8.30, uh, but it was probably too late to do anything. The invasion occurred 90 minutes later. Comparisons to the invasion of Hungary were easy to make, but also comparisons to both the Nazi invasion in 39 and the different role Soviet soldiers play in 45. In the words of Edvard Goldstucker, the head of the Czechoslovak Writers' Union, the Czechoslovak invasion was even crueler in a way than the Hitlerite invasion in 39. Hitler was our avowed enemy. We never expected anything better from him than what we got. But the Soviets were supposed to be our friends and allies, the guarantors of our independence, yet they came to murder our attempt to win just a little more freedom for ourselves. Dubček had protested the invasion, but unlike Hungary's Imre Neis, he was not killed although he and his government had to make a humiliating apology in Moscow to Brezhnev and the Soviet leaders and would soon be removed from government. The new man in charge in Czechoslovakia, Yustov Hushak, embarked on policies of normalization, undoing every reform of the Prague Spring and making it one of the more repressive Soviet satellites. Janos Kadar of Hungary would admit in 69 that what forced the Warsaw Pact's hand was 
The Czechoslovak comrades did not let us take steps to head off a catastrophe, and they didn't take care of it themselves either. Unlike in Hungary, where thousands of its own soldiers went over to the side of the revolution in 56, soldiers in the Czechoslovakian army for the most part did not, standing down under the orders of their demoralized commanding officers. Uh, the invasion of the country by Warsaw Pact forces and not NATO forces had a devastating effect on the morale of Czechoslovakia's army, which lasted for two decades. Never again were the quarter million Czechoslovak soldiers seen as a vital component of military planning. This was now supplemented by the East German Volksarmee, now seen as a newly reliable force. Most Czechs and Slovaks during the invasion engaged in passive, nonviolent resistance, although there were some deaths, 25 killed, 431 wounded. The performance of the Warsaw Pact forces, however, was not promising. Many Polish and Hungarian forces and some Soviet units, partially because of the Czechs tearing down all the signs they could find, encountered bottlenecks on the roads, got lost, and ran out of supplies and gasoline, which didn't generate optimism of how they would deal with the Western European armies in the event of the Cold War becoming hot. Um, most of the Warsaw Pact forces left in November, the Soviets stayed for a little longer. Unsurprisingly, when another analogous situation emerged in 8081, the Solidarity Crisis in Poland, Hushak and the other Warsaw Pact leaders begged off the Kremlin's inquiries about a joint invasion of Poland. Of course, the most lasting legacy of the Warsaw Pact, uh, in my opinion, of <laughs> the destruction of the Prague Spring was it killed forever in the minds of many on both sides of the Iron Curtain that the system of democratic centralism, of socialism, created by Lenin, defined by Stalin, and imposed on Eastern Europe could be reformed or democratized. So, and ironically, Gorbachev, with Glasnost and Perestroika in the 80s, attempted to revive the ideas of socialism with the human face. It was too little and too late. The story of 89 to 91 is well known, but one fascinating for and ironic forgotten detail is that when the Warsaw Pact was finally dissolved on July the 1st, 1991, it was at a meeting held appropriately enough in Prague. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, and I, I realized uh, um, there's a, a, a lot of things that, we, uh, that we're going to unpack as we move forward. Um, um, in our discussion. Uh, and before I turn it over to Dr. Nathans, I just realized I want to send a, a thank you, first of all, to all of you for coming, to our dean for taking the time to um, organize and help uh, run this panel, uh, and also to the Center for Undergraduate Research Fellowship, R Russian Area Studies, uh, the History Department, and the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest for co-sponsoring this event and the poster competition. So I would have been remiss if I forgot that. Oh, thank you, Dr. Berker. <laughs> All right. And without further ado, Dr. Nathan. Thank you. I'd like to talk about um, the reaction inside the Soviet Union, or one particular aspect of that reaction. But before I launch into this, I want to apologize for showing up late. I ran into terrible traffic on Lancaster Avenue and made you sit here and wait while I hurry from the parking garage. Um, so. One of the things about the aftermath of the invasion that's almost as shocking as the invasion itself was the unexpected appearance of a protest demonstration in Moscow, and not just anywhere in Moscow, but on Red Square, the symbolic political center, first of the Russian Empire and then of the Soviet Union. The invasion itself, of course, was a shock to anybody in the socialist camp and to many people in the West. The cynics could say, socialism already had a human face, and that was the face of Joseph Stalin. And the failure of the Prague Spring was the failure to replace that image with that of Alexander Dubček. But the true human face of socialism had already been revealed. What nobody expected was that there would be a public protest against the invasion from within the superpower that had engineered it. And the reason they didn't expect this is that the reigning theory of how the Soviet Union worked at the time, the theory that this was a totalitarian state, made it impossible to imagine that citizens would be capable, much less willing, to publicly protest the policies of their government. This is because the theory of totalitarianism tells us that the state exercises total control over its citizens down to the level of their consciousness, of their psyche. And the argument was that the Soviet state had been in existence long enough and that the Soviet Union as an experiment had already gone through 
by then about a generation and a half, that Soviet citizens were simply incapable of thinking differently than the means of mass media or propaganda were telling them. And what the Soviet mass media was telling its citizens in the immediate aftermath of the invasion starting on August 25th, 1968, was that this was a gesture of fraternal assistance at the request of the Czechoslovakian government itself, and that this action, which brought together not just Soviet troops, but as Dr. Brennan said, troops from other countries in the Warsaw Pact, had the unanimous support of the Soviet people. So the, the public message about the invasion was that it was fully supported by the Soviet population. And the, it, literally, the language of unanimity was used here. As preposterous as it may sound to say that any population of, by that time, about 150 million people could be unanimous about anything, <laughs> it wasn't actually so far-fetched. Nobody knows exactly what public opinion was in the Soviet Union in those days because there weren't public polls. The best information we have are the reports on the popular mood that were gathered by the KGB and I have never seen such a report for the period after the Second World War, although I'm confident that they exist. But I wouldn't be surprised if those reports showed that there was overwhelming support for the invasion. The logic being the Czechs and the Slovaks are these small peoples in Eastern Europe that the Soviet army liberated from Nazi occupation, liberated at the great cost of blood and treasure to the Soviet Union. And for them to imply that the Soviet model of socialism was somehow inadequate and that socialism needed a new face, maybe not even a Soviet face, to represent it amounted to something close to blasphemy or at, at least ingratitude towards their liberators. So this was, I think, the default setting for much of the Soviet population in the aftermath of the invasion. Between that set of public opinions and the Western expectations about how totalitarian societies work, nobody, and I mean nobody, expected there to be a public protest, especially in such a symbolically uh, freighted space as Red Square. What happened in Red Square was the following. On the morning of August uh, 25th, I think I misspoke before and said the invasion was the 25th. The invasion was the 20th. The tw 20th, 20th, right? 20th. Yeah. The Very night late of the 20th night. into yeah. the morning of the 21st. Right. So uh, I believe that was a Tuesday. And on the following Sunday, August 25th, eight individuals, most of them from Moscow but not all, converged on Red Square. There were five men and three women. One of the women had a baby carriage. And in that carriage was her five-month-old baby. And under the baby were a series of homemade banners that she and several of her friends had created. And those banners had painted slogans on them, which said things like, and I'm going to quote here, long live free and independent Czechoslovakia. Shame on the occupiers hands off the CSSR, that's the abbreviation for the Czechoslovak uh, Soviet Republic. And finally, and most famously, a banner that said, for your freedom and ours, mm -hmm. which was a quotation uh, of several levels of protest going back to the 1860s when the Russians had put down a Polish uprising, but even further back to the 1830s when the Poles uh, staged their first uprising against Russia imperial occupation. So it was a historically resonant uh, banner. The eight individuals who had conferred, uh, con converged on Red Square sat down before they unfurled these banners. This was a sit-down demonstration. In Russian, it was called the Sidyasha Demonstratsya. And we know from the memoir accounts that the inspiration for the idea of sitting down at a demonstration, which is a strange physical gesture to make when you're trying to make a public statement, was borrowed from Soviet 
uh, journalistic accounts of the civil rights movement in the United States. So there was a sense in which at least some of the repertoire of protest in the 60s was becoming transnational. So a sit-down demonstration in the epicenter of Soviet power, Red Square, Moscow. We know that the KGB was tipped off shortly before the demonstration by someone in this network of protesters and that they were ready to pounce. The entire affair lasted less than 15 minutes because immediately after these banners were unfurled, a series of plainclothes officers converged on the protesters, snatched the, the banners from them, in some cases tore them to shreds, and beat up the demonstrations, demonstrators. Some of them were beaten so badly that they couldn't appear in court later that week because they had so obviously been uh, battered by the, the political police. And within minutes, uh, the black Volgas came into the square and these people were carried off to the uh, Lubyanka, the KGB central prison in downtown Moscow. And several months later, they were put on trial, the charge being disruption of public order. They didn't have a permit to demonstrate in Red Square. The argument was that they were interfering either with uh, vehicular traffic or tourists in Red Square. <coughs> and some of the vehicular traffic was supposed to be those very uh, Czechoslovak leaders who had been hauled uh, back to Moscow to apologize to Brezhnev and to essentially negotiate uh, their defeat by the occupying armies. So one theory is that the protesters hoped to catch a glimpse of these men, and they were all men, as they were being uh, shuttled out of the Kremlin in limousines. And the idea was to show them that not all Soviet citizen, citizens, in fact, supported the demonstration. That the mass media in the Soviet Union was lying or was misinformed when they were telling the world that the Soviet people unanimously supported this gesture. The one other thing that I'd like to uh, tell you about the demonstration is that of these eight people, only half of them had ever met before. So you have to try to imagine what it's like to show up to a demonstration where you can be absolutely sure that the result is that your career is over, you will go to jail for somewhere between five to seven years if you're lucky, and if you're really lucky, you'll just be sent to some form of exile, either in Moldova or in Siberia. So the act of walking into the square, preparing to unfurl a banner, a banner protesting the invasion, was to basically consign the rest of your life to being either a prisoner or an ex-convict, which meant you would never have a flourishing career. Your family life, if you had one, would be ruined. It was quite possible that your immediate relatives would also be punished and perhaps banished from Moscow or whatever city they lived in. So this was uh, not a suicidal gesture, but it stopped just short of that for the protesters. So imagine you're walking into Red Square knowing that life as you know it is about to end, that you're, you're going to jail for sure, maybe worse, and you don't even know half of the other protesters. You've never met them before. They're complete strangers to you. It's a very strange situation, and this demonstration was planned with less than 24 hours notice. Contrary to the KGB's image at this time, of the dissident movement as a coordinated network of people with a leadership structure and a communication structure that allowed them to organize protests when there were trials of political figures, political opposition figures. This was the closest thing we can get to a spontaneous demonstration. So there they, there they go. They settle in in Red Square. They sit down. They unfurl the banners. The plainclothes plain KGB officers approach them seize the banners, beat them up, hustle them off into Black Volgas, off they go to prison. It's all over in 15 minutes. There's very good reason to believe that photographs and perhaps even film footage was made of this demonstration. That some of the plainclothes officers were filming it so that they could positively identify the participants. There's also eyewitness accounts that tell us that uh, Western journalists in Red Square at the time had begun to take pictures, but their cameras were seized 
film was ripped out. Many of you who are college students here have no idea what I'm talking about when I'm talking <laughs> about the film getting ripped out of cameras, but if you take film out of cameras, it's over. It's overexposed by sunlight and there is no image. So here we have, I would call it a world historical demonstration of which we have no visual evidence. Mm. I have nothing to hand out to you or to show in a PowerPoint demonstration by way of actual physical visual images of the demonstration. There may be such in the KGB archive in Moscow, but as long as Vladimir Putin is president of Russia, I'm not getting into that archive and we won't, I don't think we're gonna know about that. That, however, did not prevent this demonstration from making headlines all over the world. And these demonstrators were embraced by the West as freedom fighters, as heroes, as people who probably understood the nature of freedom better than Americans did, better than Westerners did. Precisely because we took it and take it for granted, it's the air we breathe, it's the thing we assume our system is designed to foster. <coughs> these folks, these eight demonstrators, were seen as having a heightened sense, not just of the value of freedom, but of the nature of freedom. So one of the leading protesters was a woman named Natalia Garbanievskaya, who was a poet, a dissident, and had just become the editor of the leading underground dissident journal, the Chronicle of Current Events. She became a folk hero in the West. Joan Baez wrote a song about her called Natalia. The poet Adrian Rich dedicated a poem to her as her sister. It was called For a Sister. Documentary films about this 15-minute demonstration were created in West Germany and in Japan. So this became a media sensation in the West. But how about the reception in the Soviet Union? There was no coverage of the demonstration in the Soviet press at the time. Only when the trial was held in October of 1968 was there very brief mention in one of the Moscow newspapers of the fact that the demonstration had taken place. The evidence that I've been able to uncover in the process of researching this history of the dissident movement um, that I'm finishing now is that even the majority of the dissident movement, even liberal intellectuals, even cosmopolitan liberal intellectuals in Moscow, did not approve of the demonstration. Even if they thought that the invasion was a travesty, they thought the demonstration was a mistake. One such person was a guy named Alexander Twardovsky, who was himself uh, an accomplished poet, but more importantly, he was the editor of the main literary journal, liberal, li reform-minded li um, literary journal, Novi Mir, New World, many of whose writers were entirely sympathetic to the Prague Spring. Twardowski was a veteran of the Second World War. And this is what he wrote in his diary the day after the invasion on, um, I guess it was August 22nd. And this resonates, I think, very powerfully with something that Sean said earlier. He wrote this in verse. He was a poet. And this is my uh, very crude translation. What shall we do with you, oath of mine? This is his military oath as a Soviet soldier. What shall we do with you, oath of mine? Where to find the words to relate how in 45 they greeted us in Prague and how they greet us now in 68. So here was a Soviet veteran expressing utter shame, utter humiliation at the fact that Soviet soldiers had invaded a fellow socialist country. As Sean said, the Warsaw Pact will go down in history as the only military alliance whose actual engagement was against its own members, exclusively against its own members. The Warsaw Pact never invaded a non-member of the Warsaw Pact. Remarkable fact. But even a man like Twardowski, who felt humiliated and ashamed of the invasion, was absolutely dead set against the protest. This was an act that had aired dirty laundry in public, which was a taboo in Russian and Soviet political culture. Moreover, there was an unspoken rule in Soviet politics then and now. The Kremlin exercises a monopoly over foreign policy. 
You can complain all you want about conditions inside the country, although you shouldn't really do so publicly, but nobody can interfere in the Kremlin's monopoly on foreign policy. And those banners had done exactly that. They had critiqued the external behavior of the Soviet Union. So this was a minority of dissidents within the dissident movement who embarked on this act. And of course the question of questions is, why did they do it? What motivated these eight individuals to sacrifice the rest of their professional lives and probably much of their personal lives for this demonstration? Did they think they could actually change things? Did they think that by unfurling these banners they would cause Brezhnev to scratch his chin and say, you know, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. After all, <laughs> let's pull out the troops and go back to the status quo ante the way things were on August 20th. Not for a second. We know from their diaries and their memoirs and the interviews that they've conducted in the years since that they had no illusions about any practical political benefits of this demonstration. The goals that moved them to make this extraordinary gesture were demonstrative. They wanted to show that even in the darkest moral situations, people have choices and options. And the options that they realized were still open to them was the option to disagree and the option to express their disagreement publicly and to expose the lie behind Soviet public claims that there was <coughs> unanimous support. All you had to do was get eight people on Red Square with those banners to show that the argument of unanimity was a lie. It was a lie. So they were setting a moral example of what is possible even in dark political times. With no illusions about the practical, immediate impact. So the question is, what are the long-term impact, what are the long-term effects of this kind of moral statement? Another of one of the participants was a woman named Larissa Bogodaz. She was a... Um, a linguistics scholar uh, in Moscow. She happened to have been formerly married to a, a famous dissident writer named Yuli Daniel. And she was one of the um, organizers, at least among the four people that she knew of this demonstration. Strange as it may seem, at Soviet trials, even political trials, the defendants always had the right to deliver what they called their last word. And those last words could not be censored. So this was their shining moment to get their, uh, their, their point of view expressed in the trial. And this is an excerpt of what Bogoraz said at her trial by way of explaining why she had come to the square that morning. She said, had I not done this, I would have considered myself responsible for these actions of the government, just as all adult citizens of our country bear responsibility for all the actions of our government, just as our whole people bears responsibility for the Stalin barrier camps, for the death sentences, and, and here she was cut off by the prosecutor who said that she simply could not go any further mm -hmm. down that line. However, unofficial transcripts of this trial and of the final words of the defendant were created by relatives who were in the courtroom that day. They were copied by typewriter uh, in a system known as Samizdat, of self-publishing, and these transcripts circulated far and wide in the Soviet Union. And 10 years later, lots and lots of people knew what had happened at that trial. I know this because I've seen some of their KGB dossiers, and they talk about having read transcripts of these final words. So word did get out, very indirectly and with much delay, about the protest. One Muscovite wrote in her diary, this is the literary critic, Larissa, um, Arlova, the wife of Lev Kopilev, another dissident, she said, if humanity does not perish, and I think what she had in mind was perish in nuclear war, if humanity does not perish, then this event, the August 25th demonstration, will take pride of place in textbooks on the history of 20th century Russia. So by the 70s, there were plenty of people in the Soviet Union who regarded those 15 minutes as one of the moral high watermarks in Soviet history. 
we know that there were veterans of the Prague Spring who said that that demonstration showed them that there were at least seven people in Russia not worth hating. <laughs> and there was a sense that the action of these seven or eight people, there was some confusion about how many, but we know there were eight, the actions of these eight people in the minds of many were a form of redemption, of moral redemption for the sins of the Soviet government and for those members of the populace who support them. I think it's worth reflecting on whether a demonstration by eight people can actually perform the act of redemption from sin. This is not a question for historians. This is a question for theologians. But many contemporaries view things this way. I don't think it will surprise you if I tell you that the Russian textbooks that are mandatory reading in high schools in Russia today do not mention the demonstration on Red Square in August of 68. They don't mention it because the president of that country has a visceral antipathy towards public demonstrations and does not, does not want to stoke the fire of any sort of protest. So 20th century Russian history textbooks do not yet record this event, but they may in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I, I want to just uh, ask a, a, a couple of questions from our, um, our, our panelists uh, to stoke some further conversation. And one of the things that I was thinking about as both were talking was the way that um, none of what we're talking about is existing in its, on its own island, right? That there, that there are commonalities and there are links, there are networks that either that can transcend temporally uh, across time, right? An awareness of what happened in 45, what happened in, uh, let's say, 30, 37, 39, 41, 53, 56, you know, the, the history of um, uh, invasion and occupation in Eastern and Central Europe. Um, and also uh, this idea of this youth movement. I mean, wh one of the things that it's, th it's been a theme of some of the events that the LePage Center has done this, this year is this 1968 is this moment of this, this youth energy. And so I wanted to ask either or both of you, um, if there was an element of generation, if, if there was a generational effect going going on here, a remembrance of what came before. Um, if you ever are in Prague, one of um, uh, in the main boulevard where the um, where the, the the Velvet Revolution took place in 1989, they have a a, an, a a display this year of these important years in Czech history. So it's 1918. Nine, uh, which is when the Czech Republic was founded, 1938, when the Germans came in, 1968 and 1989. So there's an awareness of the way that history flows together. And I was wondering if either in an awareness of um, the threat of, of the dangers of what happens if a, um, a protest gets out of control, how much that was playing into the decision of the, the Soviets in coming in, and conversely, in the, the, dis the dissidents that you're talking about in the Soviet Union, uh, I was struck by this idea of the, the poets, right? I mean, a lot of the dissident movement was in the Soviet Union was informed by the poets. And being in Mayakovsky Square, and, and sh it, this was a youth movement, what d were those that supported these eight demonstrators um, of the younger generation, whereas their, their older peers were more um, thinking of the Czechs as being um, ungrateful for the, the Soviets' help in 1945? Yeah, um, well, I would say in terms of uh, responding to popular movements to protests, uprisings, the threat of that, uh, yeah, absolutely for a lot of the Warsaw Pact leaders. I mean, Brezhnev, as you can see in the cartoon, <laughs> Uh, was again the kind of the face of the Soviet Union, obviously. But if you look at the Politburo discussions, he wasn't the first to call to uh, crush the Prague Spring. It was Yuri Andropov, who was the head of the KGB. And um, Brezhnev, this isn't to justify it, but he agonized over it. He couldn't, he couldn't sleep. He developed an addiction to sleeping pills, uh, partially because of this event. Um, but Andropov had been, in 1956, the Soviet ambassador to Hungary. 
So he had seen what happened directly. He had seen members of the Hungarian political police, the Aveha, lynched in the streets by Hungarians. And so the lesson he took from that was you have to crush anything that even looks uh, problematic immediately. And then he was also in 79 the first to call for the invasion of Afghanistan and to intervene in Poland in 80. Um, and then for the, for the two strongest voices of the Warsaw Pact to invade, Walter Ulbricht had been almost overthrown in June of 53. Uh, and he was a doctrinaire Stalinist anyway. I mean, if you know anything about him, it's not surprising. Gomolka uh, gets overshadowed by Czechoslovakia, but Poland had a 68 as well. And a youth uprising in the spring, when getting back to your point about Polish-Russian animosity predating 1917, uh, Polish university students wanted to have a, perform a play about the Russian... Um, crushing of the Polish uprising in the 1830s. The university authorities said no, and it led to days and days and days of student demonstration. So Gomolka was afraid that um, if the, I, I took care of it in, the, in, in my own country, but if this situation continues in Czechoslovakia, it might cause things to get out of hand here. So. It's very tempting to um, see what happened in 1968 curious if the ongoing events that you're having at Villanova this year reinforce this notion. To see this as part of a global movement, a global youth movement that is developing a common language of protest, a common repertoire of protest, uh, a set of idioms about how to oppose the, the power of states, whether you can find um, horizontal connections between these folks so that they actually know each other, there's, they're learning from each other. The argument has been made that this is a single movement stretching from Berkeley, California with the free speech movement in 1964 to the seizure of administrative buildings at Columbia University in 1968. Later that year, the demonstrations in Paris in May, uh, Frankfurt, Berlin, Torino, Rome, Prague, Moscow. Warsaw. Warsaw. I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't buy it. There is a very powerful uh, trend in the history profession these days of doing what's called transnational history, of trying to transcend the boundaries of nation states. Um, because up until 2016, we were convinced that we were part of an era of globalization when national categories were starting to evaporate, global society was emerging, NGOs and corporations and all kinds of institutions above and below the level of the state were starting to really exercise their influence globally. Well, I'm a little out of sync with that now, but more importantly, if you look at the evidence, I think there are two powerful reasons to not see this as a global movement, despite what I said about the sit-down demonstration and some learning process from the American Civil Rights Movement. So reason number one, the Prague Spring began with the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. This was not a grassroots movement initially. This was a, an internal reform movement by liberal-minded communists like Dubček. It's only after they sort of open this Pandora's box that a truly popular movement embraces some of their thinking. And by the way, some of the thinking of these communist reformers like Dubček was to disaggregate and defederalize Czechoslovakia and to create more, not a separate Czech and Slovak political space, but to have them be less centralized. So there's a decentralizing thrust that is, it's a vector going in a very different direction than um, abolishing censorship. It's about national self-determination or some version of it. So even the Prague Spring is not really a youth movement in the same sense as May 68 in Paris, uh, the free speech movement in Berkeley. This is even more the case in the Soviet Union. I would guess that the average age of those eight demonstrators um, in August of 68 on Red Square was somewhere around 40. These were not university students. They were university graduates. They were all very well educated. There were a lot of PhDs among them. Uh, Natalia Gorbanevskaya had an advanced degree. Larisa Bogaraz had a PhD in linguistics. Pavel Litvinov, who was the grandson of the former, of Stalin's foreign minister, Maxim Litvinov. So golden boy by Soviet standards, had a PhD in physics and was actually well, getting his PhD in physics and was an instructor at a physics institute in Moscow. These were 
highly educated people, but well beyond their college years. And uh, there really was no equivalent of a university-centered youth movement in the Soviet Union. The dissident movement is really a movement of middle-aged people, most of them born in the late 1920s, 1930s, sometimes early 1940s. What distinguishes this cohort of people is that they were entirely formed by the Soviet system. None of them were old enough to have been born before the revolution. And one of the reasons why they're so interesting to watch is that they are quintessential Soviet people who nonetheless have become heretics vis-a-vis uh, -vis their own orthodoxy. So that's sort of my angle in my book, is that the dissidents are completely Soviet. And we have to under understand them not as little Western liberals who've been parachuted into the Soviet Union to, to speak our language, but people who have come up through and from the Soviet system itself. But this is not a student movement. By, by any means. Yeah, I would also say that um, I, one thing I love about panel discussions like this because there's too much in your uh, belief in European history that everything ends in 45. Uh, that there's so many great stories afterwards. And um, I think one of the fascinating ironies of the Prague Spring is that obviously, on one way, people like Dubček and Zdenek the Line are much more appealing than people like Brezhnev, Ulbricht, Gomulka, and Dropov. But I think, given what happens in the 80s and early 90s, you can make a, ca a pretty clear case that those men, the men, the five, understood the system better than Dubček did. Be because it's not as if in, in Bratislava on August 3rd, they came up and told Dubček, stop doing this, and then walked out the room. They, they argued that you think you can give people freedom of speech and still maintain one party still authoritarian or semi-authoritarian rule. So what's to keep people, if you give them freedom of speech on Monday, on Tuesday saying, why is there only one political party that's been running everything for 20 years? We should have a multi-party democratic system. Mm -hmm. So their solution was we just don't, ra we don't allow them to raise these issues. And when, I, when Gorbachev tries the same thing, I mean Gorbachev admitted to a reporter from a Czech newspaper in 87, they asked, what's the difference between Glasnost and Perestroika and the Prague Spring, and Gorbachev says 20 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but if you look at what Gorbachev does to, again, try to impose some Western <laughs> ideals of, lib of freedom onto this authoritarian system, it destabilizes everything, mm -hmm. and, and it collapses. Uh, um, I mean, what Dubček was trying to do was the <laughs> argument, and this goes all the way back to Karl Marx, that you have Western ideas of freedom and liberty, freedom of speech, assembly, to vote for leaders, those are all false. Right? The true freedom is to be free from economic exploitation and have guaranteed employment, housing, and those are the freedoms our people enjoy, and that's what makes them free. We don't need to impose these Western ideas. And Dubček's like, maybe we can impose some of them, import some of them. And the pro I think the, the clearest evidence is the irreformability of the system is that Gorbachev's attempts to reform it destabilize everything. Right? And so you could argue in Czechoslovakia if, if Dubček's reforms had continued a bit longer, they might have created genuine socialism with the human face, or it might have unleashed forces they couldn't control. So with that in mind, can I push both of you on, on, um, uh, on an issue? And that is the flow of information. Right? We live in a society now where uh, the, the, the press, the media, you know, is playing a, a pivotal role in politics and also under um, under criticism and, ass and assault. Things happened very quickly here in the period of time that we're talking about. Could either of you speak to the idea about how information was flowing, um, either among the, the soldiers who were coming in as part of the invasion force or between um, Prague and Moscow? Well, we know that many of the Soviet soldiers were told that there were German troops in Czechoslovakia, that the, the counter-revolutionary conspiracy was not just um, the, the jeans-wearing, bearded uh, young demonstrators in downtown Prague, that there were actual foreign uh, conspirators trying to overthrow this government and pry it loose of the Warsaw Pact. And they were very confused, not just by, by the fact that the street signs had all been taken <laughs> down, but they really had been led to expect that they were going to have a military conflict with, with these underground forces. And, and those illusions were sustained for uh, the period of the occupation because they didn't have alternative sources of information. 
But the dissidents certainly did. And in fact, any Soviet citizen who had a radio, um, or I should say an adjusted radio that could pick up short waves, was getting information from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the Voice of America, the Deutsche Welle, the BBC, and other uh, Western-run shortwave radio broadcast services that were beaming news in real time to the entire European sections of the Soviet Union, not to mention the, the uh, Eastern Bloc countries themselves. Natalia Gorbanevskaya, that poet who I mentioned, like most poets, couldn't earn, earn a living uh, writing poetry, so she did what a lot of poets do, which she made money by translating. She was fluent in Czech and Polish. And uh, at the time of the invasion, the kiosks in Moscow were still selling copies of newspapers from their uh, fraternal states, uh, satellite states in Eastern Europe. And the, the Czech, main Czech newspaper, uh, Rude Prava, I think mm -hmm. it is? Yeah. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. Um, that was a very open liberal paper at the time. So those who could read Czech uh, really had access to, to very good news coverage of the Prague Spring as it was unfolding in real time. So Garbanievska would go to the kiosks, buy the paper, and translate it for her friends. And between that and the radio broadcast, they had a very good sense of what was really going on on the ground. And that's why they were ready to respond within about uh, just a couple of days of the invasion with this demonstration. I guess one other point I, I, I'd make with regards to the Warsaw Pact was that, I mean, another long-term legacy of this, besides, again, uh, damaging the idea of reforming the system, was that uh, for many Czechs in particular, but even some Poles, uh, they were willing to put up with the Warsaw Pact because of a country that they, f that they were still afraid of, and that was West Germany. Uh, because even though the propaganda told them that America, the United States of America is our number one enemy, most Poles and Czechs weren't worried about them. They were worried about West Germany because when that government is formed in 49, it still lays claim to the Sudetenland, Silesia, West Prussia, everything that they lost in 45 at Potsdam. And if I could just intervene, that's because there was no treaty after the Second right. World War. So there, yeah, because you got two different German governments. Right. And, and <clears throat> many Poles and, and Czechs would get letters from former Germans who lived there, now living in Austria or West Germany, saying, we know you're living in our home. We know you're living in our lands. We're going to come back one day and get them, and we're holding you responsible for whatever you did there. And so, again, the idea is, as much as we don't like the Soviets, uh, they will at least protect us from that threat. Because it's not until the early 70s that Willy Brandt's government signs that away. But now, after the Warsaw Pact of Agent 68, the Soviets attacked, and, and not the West Germans. And for, for the Czechs in particular, I mean, again, Poles and Russians had a long-standing animosity. The Czechs didn't really have that until 68. I mean, until World War I, until 1918, they had been ruled by Austrians for 298 years. And then again, the Soviet Union hadn't been a part of the Munich Agreement. And the Red Army behaved itself better in 45. And you could argue after 68, the, the animosity that so many Hungarians and East Germans and Poles felt to the Soviets now was carried on by the Czechs, except for those eight people. <laughs> Um, perhaps if, if I could open it up to the audience, if anyone has any uh, question that they'd like to ask of either of our our panelists. Yes, I have to ask. I'm totally intrigued. How did eight people who didn't know each other know when to meet and where and how did that work? The logistics. About four of them knew each other, and the other the other four. Were um, word had gone out the night before that anybody who wanted to could participate in this demonstration. And when I say gone out, I mean at one of the many uh, weekly gatherings at the apartments of various citizens. Facebook, Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> yes. yes, in their dreams. Um, the beauty of Samizdat, by the way, is that unlike Facebook, it is not subject to hacking. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that you don't have to endure a Blitzkrieg of advertising <laughs> to get your network information. There's a certain romanticism about some of that these days. So word had gone out, but what's, what's really interesting, I think, is that there was a kind of unspoken rule that it was improper to pressure anyone to take part in the demonstration. The idea being to go to this demonstration means your life as you know it is over and there could be serious repercussions for your family, 
and that to apply moral pressure on people to participate was to reproduce the constant mobilization of the Soviet state. And the dissidents had had it with that kind of mobilization. They did not want to constantly be badgered and hectored to participate in demonstrations. So there's this very peculiar ethos of you sort of announce the news, but that's the end of the conversation. You don't ask people whether they're coming. You don't pressure them to come. Those who show up, show up, and everyone else can either watch or learn about it later. And that's why relatively few people actually came, because there, there really was no coordinated effort to produce a turnout. Again, the object was simply expose the lie of unanimity. And all you needed was just a handful of people with banners to do that. Yes, Mike. Going to uh, skepticism on the, the transnationality of what happened to you. Would you go so far as to say that there wasn't a leg up, that there wasn't a spirit of that the dissidents in the Soviet Union would have to do? Uh, you said yourself that, that they sat down with the fake friends of America, uh, American sit down, not sit in. No, I think the, the case can be made that there was a kind of zeitgeist. And we know that the dissidents were avid readers of Soviet coverage of the demonstrations in Paris, of uh, what was going on in Mississippi and Alabama. So you're right. They were rather well informed. Whether they identified themselves as counterparts of demonstrators in other countries, I kind of doubt. There was the generational difference. Uh, politically, they occupied a very different social location in Soviet society than the demonstrators in Paris or Berkeley or New York did. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting question. And, and when you invoke something like the spirit of the time, by definition, that is something that's kind of, it slips through your fingers. You, know, you can't quantify it. It doesn't have an institutional home. It's a form of consciousness. Consciousness is very important as a motivator or, or explainer of people's behavior. But it's, it's hard to, to pin down. You, you, even if you know what they know, what they knew and what they read and, and the pictures that they saw, it's hard to say what they extracted from those words and those images. But you're right. That information was in circulation. And I would say uh, in the post-World War II era, almost every decade in European and global history has a year like that. 56, 68, 79, the year I was born, 89. And, then he went, uh, and I would say one day 2016 will go down as one of those years, too. And, and so and it's hard for the historian to avoid that. But, I, yeah, I completely agree with your point. You don't want to get carried away too much saying that this was one global movement, especially if you compare, again, students in Warsaw uh, protesting their own communist regime with students in Paris carrying banners of Mao and Che Guevara. Right. Yeah, uh, whoops. Oh. Sorry. That's okay. Uh -huh. What? Uh, <laughs> One thing I, I would add uh, back to Prague a little bit too, though, is after the Soviet invasion. I mean, as the Soviets come in, you know, it is uh, the youth college students who are in the streets yeah. and, you know, confronting the tanks. Um, and then in the aftermath, and one of my students did a, a original artwork um, depicting this, uh, the way the college students continued to protest when Dubček was out of the picture and it looked like. Stalinism was returning was they took a very dramatic and horrific uh, form of protest. They would, uh, uh, starting with a, a Czech man by the name of Jan Pollock, they would light themselves on fire in Wenceslas Square um, and called themselves human torches as a way to uh, bring awareness. And so it was this really horrific um, experience, but they became uh, in this long tradition of martyrs, you know, who have their final word through their own sacrificial um, behavior. That particular idiom of protest, dousing yourself with gasoline and lighting yourself on fire, 
also has a, uh, a lineage. Mm -hmm. They were adopting the techniques of the Buddhist monks in South Vietnam, who beginning in 1963 and 1964, as acts of protest against the, the repression of Buddhism by the Catholic government or the Catholic leader, um, Diem of South Vietnam, lit themselves on fire in public spaces. And that technique uh, is revived by Jan Pollock and then stretching into 1970, 1971, 72, students in the Soviet republics of Latvia and Estonia and Lithuania mimic this. It's kind of a copycat gesture, um, this, this gesture of, of desperation and protest by a death. Believe it or not, there's actually a website devoted to this technique that has a uh, you know, year by year uh, chronology of self immolations. Revolutionary and suicide. Revolutionary suicide. Uh, there's a kind of macabre wordplay in Russia. One of the, uh, I'll try to make this as brief as possible, one of the criticisms of the demonstrators uh, in, in Red Square in August of 68 by people in the dissident movement who supported their cause but thought that the demonstration was a waste of, of talent, basically. Like these were the leaders of the, some of the leaders of the dissident movement. And they were kissing their, their dissident careers goodbye, not just their professional careers, but they were henceforth unable to play any role in the dissident movement, and that struck people as impractical and a waste. So there's a Russian play on words to self-immolation is called samasajinya, uh, self-burning. And there was a joke in, Soviet jokes are the best source of information about everything. And there was a joke that what the demonstrators had done was samasajinya, which is like putting yourself in prison. Because in the, the word to go into prison in Russian is to sit. Like we say do time, they say to sit. So they had sort of put themselves in prison, which is just one vowel away from self-immolation. The idea being that it was a similarly impractical, terrible waste of human capacity and human talent. Dramatic, yes, but not pragmatic politically. Yes. Anna. Well, yeah, uh, the, the mentality was, uh, amongst many um, of the Soviet leaders, was that if the West didn't intervene in East Berlin in 53 or in Hungary in 56, they won't intervene this time. And since it, 68 was such a chaotic period in, in, uh, in uh, American history and the history of many Western European countries, too, there were a lot of diplomatic protests. Um, it's funny, I was actually in, in Pittsburgh at the end of September talking about Henry Cabot Lodge's brief tenure as ambassador to West Germany. And so NATO did do, ironically, a big military mobilization in West Germany along the Czech border because there was a fear of the West German government, the American government, could there be a move? Is this the pretext to something bigger, right? Are they going to move against NATO now? So there was, for a couple of months, there was a big fear, there was a concern in NATO command about that. And so they mobilized their own forces to prepare for that. Um, but then eventually they decided, actually, you know what, if they're going to invade someone else, they're going to invade Romania, which was the one Warsaw Pact country that didn't participate, and its leader, Ceausescu, publicly criticized the invasion. Um, at, but then, of course, uh, the, the question is, so why didn't, why didn't the Soviets invade Romania? It was because Romania was, the, along with Albania, mm -hmm. Europe's North Korea, was the most repressive communist regime of all of them in Eastern Europe. So the Soviets knew that we don't want our own citizens drawing favorable comparisons to the Czechs in terms of how much more freedom they live under. But they knew no Soviet citizens wanted to be like Romania. So Ceausescu was a pain, he was a distraction, but um, he wa that, that wasn't a threat the way uh, with Czechoslovakia was. Do you want, yeah. oh, no. So I, w I was going to say, um, with that, I think we have uh, occupied your attention for quite some time, but we will be here if you'd like to follow up with any questions or look at some of the posters. Um, but I ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for taking their time and sharing their expertise. Um, and thank you. <laughs>
Villanova's.